Okay. Can you all see my screen okay? Yep. Fantastic. Great. So let's get started then. So what we're going to do, we're going to cover three things. The economic utility and the monetary utility of Bitcoin, and what it is, why it was created. And then we'll go into the social utility and then environmental utility. And after that, we can get around some questions. So let's get started. Firstly, uh, this is one of the hats that I wear. This is the best place to find me on Bitcoin Twitter. Uh, incidentally, that's the best way to get information on Bitcoin. If you read mainstream media sources, it's probably about five years behind in terms of its understanding. Uh, Bitcoin Twitter is probably the best place. You also see that I have a research site, batcoins.com. And also a newsletter that I write. You don't need to get that newsletter. That's only really relevant if you want to go deep into the social and the environmental aspects of Bitcoin. So I write pretty regularly for three or four of the Bitcoin magazines that are around. The research that I've done, particularly on the ESG case for Bitcoin, so that's looking at the social and environmental utility has been covered in a lot of the mainstream news media as well. And right now I'm launching my third climate tech fund, which is a specialist infrastructure investment fund, which puts money into Bitcoin mining projects that are on landfills, mm -hmm. which are mitigating methane that would have gone into the atmosphere. They're instead turning it into fuel for generators, which then turn it into electricity, which is then used for Bitcoin mining. And just recently, I've also taken on a role on the advisory board of Marathon, which is a NASDAQ trading Bitcoin mining company. So just a quick question. Uh, does anyone know what a touch integrated OLED panel is? Anyone ever heard of one of them? No, I thought not. Anyone ever heard no. of an iPhone? <laughs> yes. A few more people, right. So in the same way, Whilst Bitcoin has a multi-decade history and many technological complexities, you don't have to understand the inner workings of the blockchain or how hashing or mining works, how a meme pool works in order to be able to use Bitcoin, just as I don't have to understand how TCP IP works in order to use the internet. So we're not going to go into this. Instead, we're going to go into this. And this is my favorite definition of Bitcoin. Someone just figured out how to make internet native digital scarcity. So the key idea here is that whilst it was really hard to do this on the internet, things are very easy to copy, right? You can copy and paste text. You can copy files. You can copy images and send them anywhere, replicate them. So that's great when it comes to files and text and emails and images, but it's really bad with money. You don't want to be able to double spend money. So someone had to work out a way to do that in a way which was scarce and yet digital. And Satoshi Nakamoto, he, the, he, she, or they, we don't quite know, uh, was a pseudonymous person who in 2008 created the white paper for Bitcoin. And then on the back of that, we have had this, the first time ever we've had a, a digital native internet money. So by that, I don't just mean that it's uh, regular money that we use, but it's just got a front end on the internet, but actually digitally native. So it runs through the internet. So what exactly is Bitcoin, apart from this digital scarcity? Well, it has three unique properties which distinguish it from any other form of currency, and in fact, any other form of cryptocurrency. The first one is that it has a money supply ceiling. There are can only ever be 21 million Bitcoin. And that's increasingly important in this day and age where money printing can happen in a fiat-based economy at will. Second is that it is very secure. It is multiple times more secure than the world's securest banks. And, and that's because of the tremendous energy cost which would be required in order to attempt to hack the network. And even if you did hack it, you need to then form a continuous blockchain uh, using progressively more and more energy until you needed all the energy in the world to be able to try and keep up the fake. It's just not possible. So it's incredibly secure. And the third really incredibly important feature is that no one centrally controls it. Unlike central banks or any other form of money right now, it's a completely peer-to-peer -peer network. So it's distributed like the internet itself. So if any one node goes down, another node can come up. And why is that important? Well, it's, it's incredibly important because it influences who uses it and how we can use it. And so if we go right back to the intention behind Bitcoin, 
the clue is in the source. And this is called the Genesis block. This is the first block of Bitcoin ever mined. You don't need to know what all those numbers mean. But the salient point is actually this point in the corner here, which says January 2009, Chancellor on brink of second bailout. So yes, Bitcoin was created during the global financial crisis. And that's important because Satoshi Nakamoto observed firsthand how this was occurring and made a famous statement about the need for a peer-to-peer -peer currency. He said the root problem with conventional currency is all the trust that is required to make it work. Trust that broke down during the global financial crisis. The central banker must be trusted not to debase the currency, which they currently are. But the history of fiat currencies is full of breaches of that trust. Banks must be trusted to hold our money and transfer it electronically, but they lend it out in waves of credit bubbles with barely a fraction in reserve. We have to trust them with our privacy, trust them not to let identity thieves drain our accounts. And if you look back through recent history, even in the West, we've seen that numerous breaches of this trust have occurred countless times, both with our actual banks and central banks. And if you think it's bad in the West, you ain't seen nothing until you've gone into some of the countries in the global South. So Bitcoin was a response to what Satoshi observed when banks did lend out in credit bubbles. It contributed to almost collapsing the entire global economy. And then what happened? The government directed central banks to print more money to give to the banks, to bail the banks out, while the rest of society was left out to hang out to dry, which created massive wealth disparities and a system which was morally bankrupt in terms of the risk, where you can basically be rewarded for speculative trading and even trading and economic activity, which uh, no one, <laughs> how would I put this, um, which was totally something that if you're a parent of a family, you wouldn't want to role model to your children. And yet this standard was occurring with bankers and they were bailed out for it. So central banking was part of the problem. What's interesting about Satoshi is that we tend to be told that human behavior is motivated by the desire for fame, the desire for power, and the desire for money. Satoshi received no money from Bitcoin. There was no founder's pool. Satoshi received no fame and received no power. He remains synonymous to this day. So that flies in the face of that belief system that something could be created by the people for the people without involving any central authority, any surveillance, and that the creator themselves or himself or herself didn't actually receive any of those things that we traditionally think are important currencies. Now, my background is working with technology companies and typically in a technology company, you have a group of founders and they founder a technology company. Then you have angel investors who come in. And then a little bit further down the track, you have venture capitalists. And then finally, you have an IPO, and then it's available for the first time to retail investors. And the interesting thing is that during this phase from founding right up to when it goes public, uh, we're very familiar with a 1,000x multiplier on valuation. So this happens all the time. So when you see some of these crazy multipliers with Bitcoin, it may seem uh, wild or like some sort of get-rich-quick scheme, but really it's not. It's just a technology and as it follows a user adoption curve, then you see these vast increments in valuation. And this has happened with a lot of technology companies already. It's also happening with Bitcoin. The interesting thing about Bitcoin, though, is that it reverses this. So in the early days of Bitcoin, we didn't have founders. We had the cypherpunks. They were a group of people who uh, believe passionately about protecting people's data sovereignty and security. Uh, then we had the drugs and libertarians who came in. We had Silk Road, which was a method where basically you could buy anything, including uh, cocaine and heroin using Bitcoin online. And a lot of the same, the myths still perpetuate to this day that Bitcoin is for drug users and criminals was because there was a time in its history where that was true. And that was around 2011, 2012. Uh, that site no longer exists. And today, even the... U.S. Treasury says that fiat currency is the preferred method for cyber criminals. But look at the, what happened in 2017 and 2021. It's flipped on its head. The general public got access to Bitcoin before the institutional investors. So it's totally the other way around from a traditional technology company. 
So as part of this incredible democratization uh, that's occurred through Bitcoin, there's a couple of ways it's flipped on its head. That's one of them. And because institutionals weren't able to invest in Bitcoin, they didn't have a vehicle to be able to do it. It didn't happen until 2021. And Wall Street hasn't had access to Bitcoin until this year with the advent of the ETFs or exchange traded funds, which allow them to get in a way which is uh, passes regulatory compliance. In terms of adoption, Bitcoin is following the same trend as the internet. It's on an exponential growth curve. There are roughly 300 million Bitcoin users today. So that's less than 1% of the world's population. So we're still actually very early. A lot of times people say, I wish I got in earlier. I feel like I'm too late. Well, we're still incredibly early. We're roughly where internet was in 2025. No, 2005 rather. In fact, not even that. <laughs> We're where the internet was in 1999. So that gives you a sense of how early we are. Okay. Every four years, something quite exceptional happens, and that's called the halving. So in order to keep this fixed cap of 21 million Bitcoin, there are new Bitcoin which are issued. But if the same amount of Bitcoin were always issued, then within the next eight years, all of the supply would have been issued completely. But what happens is that every four years, the amount of additional supply that comes onto the network is halved, and the last Bitcoin ever will be put onto the network in 2140. Now, you've got two factors acting in parallel, supply and demand. So demand's going up as user adoption is going up exponentially. That would be enough to drive up price by itself. In addition to that, you also have supply scarcity or supply shock. So every four years, the amount of supply coming onto the network goes in half. Uh, there's nothing in the world that does that. Shares don't do that. If people want to buy more shares, more shares can be issued. Gold has an inflation rate of around 1.7% is created every year, which means within 40 years, there'll be twice as much gold in the world. Imagine what would happen to the real estate market if there was an exponentially increasing demand for property, but the amount of available property was cut in half every four years. That gives you an idea of what's happening with Bitcoin. And so if we look at price here, after the first halving, and it happens every four years, price was 1250. Four years later, 630 plus. Four years later, over 8,000. The last halving has just occurred. I went to a halving party last week, 61,000. So the multipliers were 51x, 13x, and 7.2x. If we zoom out a little bit, we're in a very interesting period right now where we have this currency called fiat money. Fiat literally means by decree. In other words, it has value because the government says it has value or some authority says it has value. How paper currencies evolved was interesting. People used to trade gold. And then they worked out it was kind of inconvenient to have to get your gold to physically trade it. So they just write pieces of paper which said, I owe you the value of this gold. And they'd sign it and that would be passed on. And then people realized that those paper promissory notes had value in and of themselves. And so they started to be traded. And for many, many years, that was the currency that was used. And there would always be gold somewhere which would make good that paper currency. In 1971, Richard Nixon decided to link, cut the link between those paper promissory notes called US dollars and the gold currency, therefore made the US currency, and because it's a global reserve, every currency in the world became a fiat monetary system, which means there was nothing backing it, that they weren't uh, signifying any value beyond themselves. And that was like a 50-year experiment, and what's happened since then has been wealth gaps have increased. The value of money has decreased. It has become possible for governments to avoid making politically unsavory policies, such as raising taxes, taxes, because they can simply print more money. Uh, wars have become longer, because you can sponsor wars on credit. And all sorts of other perversions have occurred, because now the government has this infinite supply of money that they can simply print. But of course, printing more money doesn't create more wealth any more than printing more degrees uh, makes people more intelligent. It just means that there's the same amount of goods and services, but there's more money to represent it, which means the purchasing power of your goods and services go down every single year. And we have this thing called inflation, but the actual reported inflation numbers are nothing like the real inflation numbers, because it doesn't include a whole lot of things that go up in value fast, such as real estate or energy. 
if everyone was told the true inflation figures um, every year, I think there'd probably be a revolution pretty soon when people realize just how much their purchasing power was being eroded. But we feel it. We feel it because the money doesn't go as far as it used to. And the reason is this fiat money printing that is occurring. But if we look back before the age of fiat, we had gold for 5,000 years. And we're in an age now where we're transitioning from analog currency, gold, to digital currency or Bitcoin. And that could be in existence for another 5,000 years. And there's this crossover that's occurring. So there's no question that we will go from analog money to digital money, just as we there's no question we'd go from analog music to digital music or newspapers to the internet. It's, it's just a superior technology in every way, shape, or form. It's more portable, more scalable. It's faster. Uh, it's easier to divide. Uh, you can leave countries with it. Try leaving a country with 10,000 dollars worth of gold strapped to you, you have it confiscated. If we look at how institutional investors look at Bitcoin, one of or how they look at assets generally, what they try to do is diversify a portfolio and to try to carry assets which are not strongly correlated. So for example, if you, the econ economy is going to go into a recession, you want to make sure that your portfolio doesn't go down. So, for example, if there's a war and oil prices go up, uh, that's bad. You could be exposed. So if you hold oil stocks, you'll hedge that bet by also buying stocks in an airline. So then you can trade the raw performance of each stock in oil and each stock in an airline without being exposed to the macroeconomic fluctuations. Because as oil prices go up, uh, the prices of airlines go down because they are no longer as profitable because they need to use a whole lot of oil. And conversely, oil prices go down, stocks and airlines go up because their single biggest expense, uh, consumable expense, is oil. And what this is telling us here is that Bitcoin is actually very weakly correlated to other asset categories, which makes it a very desirable asset to hold in a wider portfolio. These numbers are very small in terms of the correlations. It has gone up a little bit recently. This is slightly old data, uh, but still much more weakly correlated to some of these other asset classes. Bitcoin is very volatile. It has wild swings. It goes up massively in value, and then it has these big drawdowns as well. When you look at it over a four-year period, however, this is the way, this is called risk-adjusted return using something called the Sharpe Ratio, which is something that an institutional investor would use to understand the performance of an asset class. So this is comparing the four-year performance of Bitcoin versus gold, US stocks, US real estate, bonds, and emergent currencies. And as you can see, that top orange line is outperforming consistently um, every single data point you could pick during a four-year period. So that's the risk-adjusted return. It's a return discounted for the risk or volatility. Now, just on these four years, if you are considering getting into Bitcoin, uh, I'm not an investment advisor, so nothing here is investment advice. What I would say is two things. Number one is to educate yourself about any asset class you're getting into, which is part of what this is doing. And the second thing is to take a long-term view. Do not try to time your entry to the market. Um, don't go into Bitcoin if you need to pull it out within six months, because in six months it could have wildly gone down. Take a minimum four-year view of it, because if you've seen from the halving cycles across any four-year period, it's historically always gone up. Of course, historical performance is not a guarantee of future performance, but because of those key dynamics of supply going down, every four years and halving and demand continuing to go up with the exponential growth curve of user adoption, uh, the dynamics are playing out in the right direction. This is sometimes people ask, well, what about other cryptocurrencies? Uh, this is a graph created by a good friend of mine, Willy Wu. And what it's showing here is the performance since the rise the last peak in 2017, the, the peak before the last, uh, and what you see is that all of these different forms of cryptocurrency other than Bitcoin always started off good and they're all trending downwards. And on the y-axis, this is a factor of 10. Uh, so it goes 1, 10, 100, 1,000. So this is a logarithmic scale. So they're starting at 10, they're going to 1. It means they're, they're basically lost about 90% of their value, most of them. So what happens with these other altcoins, they can 
they pump, but then they can also dump very fast. And the reason for that is very simple, which is that Bitcoin has by far the largest market capitalization. It's the most widely accepted form of cryptocurrency, but also because of those properties I mentioned. It's truly decentralized. It has a fixed supply of 21 million. You cannot create more. And it is backed by energy. And the combination of those three things make it unique across any type of cryptocurrency technology. Mm -hmm. So in terms of how you get into Bitcoin, you know, what you actually do, how you get exposure to it, there are a number of different ways. There's no one right way. Sometimes people say, what's the best way to start? Or, and it really depends. Uh, because just like money, um, if you have $10, you're going to store it in a different way than if you have $10 million. And it's the same with Bitcoin too. So it tends to work on an axis between on the right, we have easy to use. At the left, we have very secure, uh, just like fiat money. So this is the Lightning work Network. This is a layer two network. So an analogy would be a wire transfer is level one and a visa transaction is layer two. Now, you don't go to a cafe and do a wire transaction of funds right? using the base layer of money. Uh, that would be highly secure, but you would pay a big fee and it would take days to process. Your coffee would have gone cold. You would use a layer two transaction such as Lightning. And the Lightning Network can process billions of transactions for nominal fees. And when I say nominal, you're talking about a fraction of a cent. So not per cents, but cents. Uh, so the fees are less, it's instantaneous, and it can transact faster than Visa. Now, you can also store using a Lightning wallet. Here's two examples here. If you're in the US, you can use Strike, but not Wallet of Satoshi. If you're outside the US, you can use Wallet of Satoshi, but not Strike. So which era you're in also will dictate what sort of wallet you're using. So these ones are very easy to use. You can set them up. You don't need to create a 12-character seed phrase. There's nothing to forget. It's on your phone. Very simple to transact, uh, but it's not particularly secure. If you wanting, and what I mean by that is um, that if you have more than a thousand dollars, you probably want to get your own wallet, um, your self custody wallet. And so then we go along. We've got these categories up here: up BlackRock, Fidelity, etc. They're your ETFs. Um, they're not recommended unless you're a Wall Street institutional investor and you're regulated, where you cannot self custody your Bitcoin. You have to go through a fund. Um, they take fees, and also you're relying on a third party to custody your Bitcoin, which means it's no longer completely peer-to-peer. -peer. Then if, you, if you're in the US, or I think the US, maybe Europe as well, you can go to a company such as Swan Bitcoin, and you can, anything less than $10,000, you can um, get exposure to your own Bitcoin and store it on the base layer. And then you have exchanges such as Coinbase, and then you have wallets such as Exodus, which is the one that we use, which you just go to the website and that maybe a 10 minute process to set up. Uh, and then you can start to self custody your own Bitcoin. And really these last ones here, you would only consider using if you have uh, seven figures plus to store. This is a multi-signatory wallet. So that means, as it suggests, um, if someone attacks you on the street and demands your seed phrase, it's not going to be used to them because it requires multiple signatures to be able to get access to that wallet. So highly, highly secure. So that's really just a small introduction to Bitcoin as an asset class. A lot of people believe, well, that's all very well, but other than a speculative asset, it has no value. And the reason people tend to believe that is that they've never had anyone who explain to them what the other values are, and so they assume that it doesn't have any. Uh, but nothing could be further from the truth. I mentioned earlier that Bitcoin flips on its head the fact that it gives exposure to retail investors before institutionals. The other thing that flips on its head is it's given access to the global south and the developing world. They're adopting Bitcoin way faster than the West. That's right. So this chart here is showing you the top 10 nations for cryptocurrency adoption. There are not many from the West, are there? And if you look at the top two, now, what do they both have in common? Any guesses? Inflation. Absolutely. And not just inflation, hyperinflation. Last time I checked, Turkey was 65%. Argentina was more than 100%. 
So at hundred percent inflation, what that means is your wealth has half the value it did in three hundred and sixty-five days. After two years, it has a quarter of the value. After three years, it has one eighth of the value. So families who are storing their wealth are seeing it go virtually to zero. And so for them, the case for Bitcoin is very simple, is that it provides a method to stop the devaluing of their currency. Turkey, same thing. And that's possible because Bitcoin, unlike fiat currencies, you can only have 21 million. It's that supply cap. Okay, these countries here, what they have in common is a little bit less obvious. And that is that they have a very high proportion of the population who are unbanked. So if you live in a country such as the UK or New Zealand or the US or Canada or Australia or Japan, we're used to 97% plus of the population having access to banking. That is not the case in these countries where 20% plus do not have, not have any access to banking. And so for them, what it allows is for them to leapfrog banking technology and go straight to Bitcoin and be their own bank. So in Nigeria, for example, what happened was in many places in Africa, they didn't have a widely developed telecommunication network, but then they didn't have to because the mobile network came along and they leapfrogged that technology and went straight to the new technology. Same is happening with Bitcoin, where they're leapfrogging the need for a banking system and they can be their own bank by holding a phone. And when I say phone, I don't mean a smartphone even. You can have a traditional feature phone, like one of those old Nokias, you remember? Uh, and even using that, the $10 Nokia phone, you can transact using Bitcoin. And mobile feature phones and smartphones are more ubiquitous throughout the world than access to fresh drinking water. So why are people using it in these developing countries? Well, for one thing, it means that theft becomes less viable. It means that you can store things safely. It lowers incidents of domestic violence in families where people are having arguments about money because they can't be stolen or taken or seized. It cannot be frozen by authorities. Uh, you cannot be scammed for it. So it solves a whole lot of problems. And also, if you want to transact between one country and another in Africa, well, right now it's got to go through some middleman in Europe uh, and then go back to Africa, maybe if you got all the details right. Takes days. Uh, you get the tip it clicked. And it's uh, slow and clunky and unreliable when you have to travel to a bank to do it, which if you live in a rural area can take hours on unreliable roads, where if you do it on a Bitcoin phone, you can do it instantaneously. So it has a number of big advantages. And so that's why the top eight countries here all have a high proportion of unbanked. And these countries here, what they have in common is that they are all classified as either authoritarian or semi-authoritarian nations. Now, why is that important? Well, we take one case where in Nigeria, there's a death squad called SARS. It doesn't mean what SARS means to us. It's a government squad of people where if you're speaking against the government, um, you can suddenly disappear. There were protests against SARS and their death squads recently. And what happened was that the government was surveilling where payments were going. Uh, it was putting people in jail who received payments, but also people who made payments. So the government was able to weaponize the financial system against the people. And then what happened is they heard of this thing called Bitcoin. They switched to Bitcoin. They were able to continue the human rights demonstration. So people are using it as a tool to avoid government surveillance, government censorship, government deplatforming, and government weaponizing a financial system for human rights reasons. And it's been used increasingly, particularly in nations which are facing both hyperinflation and an authoritarian government as a tool of freedom and as a tool of wealth preservation. And we're not talking about small numbers of people. There are a quarter of a billion people facing hyperinflation. That second figure should say billion. There are 1.7 billion people who are unbanked. There are 5.5 billion people who live under autocracy. So in terms of market size, this is the market size of people who have a valid use case of Bitcoin. And already we're seeing millions of people who have adopted it for that exact reason. 70%, according to um, one executive from, from a Bitcoin mining company, 70% of transactions under $1,000 are coming from the African continent right now. So if we look at, I'm not going to go through all of these, but these are some examples of documented cases in the media of how Bitcoin has been used throughout the world. So 
from time to time, you'll get something that gets into a traditional magazine such as Wired, um, such as BBC. But for the most part, you just don't. Uh, but I'll just pick one at random here. So we've got number five, helping 19.4 million Afghanistani women avoiding state-level financial discrimination. Uh, so what happens in Afghanistan, if you happen to have been one of the women in that country, uh, you're not allowed to hold a bank account without the signatory of, of a male. And that male has to uh, give you access. You cannot have direct access. So it means you cannot open a business if you're a woman. It means it's hard to receive payments if you're a woman. With Bitcoin, you can circumvent uh, that basic human rights abuse. And a lot of Bitcoiners have been doing this in Afghanistan, allowing businesses to set up, run by women, paying women, using Bitcoin. And it's been a tool of human freedom. So you can't ban Bitcoin. Governments have tried to ban it. You cannot ban Bitcoin. It's a peer-to-peer -peer network. It's like trying to ban the internet. You can only ban yourself from using it, but people will find ways around it. If you're interested to know more about the social benefits, there's a great book called Check Your Financial Privilege by Alex Glanstein, who's a good friend of mine. He's the chief growth officer at the Human Rights Foundation and a passionate Bitcoin advocate uh, who, and the entire Human Rights Foundation, by the way, is staunchly pro-Bitcoin because they have seen firsthand how it's a tool which has enabled people to continue fighting for human rights where they couldn't safely using a fiat monetary system, which is the first thing that gets cut off if people want to stop those peaceful protests or human rights actions. Let's talk about environmental impact in one of my passion areas. So our fund did some analysis. And when you work in the field of venture capital, you get used to not believing anyone and doing your own research, and it's called due diligence. And so we did some due diligence on Bitcoin and what we found was that it had many more positive uh, use cases than negative externalities by 21 to 5. And then we thought, well, that doesn't really say much because those five negative externalities could have much more heavy weighting. So that could still be ne negative. So we did some deeper analysis and we started to quantify the relative impact of the positive and negative environmental externalities. Uh, and it actually blew our minds. We found that it was wildly net positive for the environment as well. And I'm not going to go through all 21 reasons for that, but I will go through one. So here's a claim that you see very often on the side of electric vehicles, zero emissions. Is this true? Is this false? Well, it depends on your definition of emissions. It's true in terms of it has no scope one emissions. In other words, there is nothing that will come out of the car, which is an emission. However, it does have scope two emissions because that electricity came from somewhere. And unless you're in a country mm. like Paraguay or Norway or Iceland or Bhutan, then it would have had some component of fossil fuel in there. If you're in New Zealand, it'll be about 18%. If you're in the US, it'll be about 60%. If you're in Kazakhstan, it'll be about 88%. So there is a carbon impact. And in the same way, this is a Bitcoin mining rig. This is also 100% electrified. So it's pure electricity. There are no fossil fuels used directly as scope one in Bitcoin. Like electric vehicles, it has scope two emissions, which comes from the underlying electricity source. Now, Bitcoin mining is important. It's playing three functions, which are vital to the securitizing of this decentralized monetary system. Verification, security, and issuance of new supply. So in traditional banking terms, it's the auditor. Bitcoin mining is the cybersecurity. And Bitcoin mining is also the central bank, which is responsible for the issuance of new currency. The only difference is that it'll issue new currency algorithmically, where you can know exactly how much currency will be issued 10 years in advance. You can't do that with the central bank. Interestingly, the what this is telling us is that hash rate is going up. Hash rate is a measure of the combined computational power of the network, and it's going up very fast. But interestingly, over a four-year period, emissions has not increased. And the reason that, and this is anomalous with any other industry, when you see there's more compute power or your winding industries, emissions will always go up. So why isn't it happening with Bitcoin? Well, it's happening for two reasons. But the main reason is that it is predominantly sourced through sustainable 
electricity. It's gone up immensely. In fact, since the China ban three years ago, a lot of those coal stations came offline and Bitcoin mining migrated to places like the United States, initially Kazakhstan, but then it got quasi banned there too, and then went to the United States, which was uh, and a lot of the grids which had a high wind and solar component, such as in West Texas. They went to places like Paraguay, they went to places like Norway, and they went to places like Ethiopia, which are almost 100% renewable energy sourced. And that has radically lifted the amount of sustainable energy. So it's now um, has a higher sustainable energy use than any modern industry, and in fact, any major industrialized country. If you compare it to other industries, including the banking sector and the gold industry, which it will eventually at least partially obviate, and probably fully obviate in terms of gold, um, it's massively more sustainable. And we're only talking about emissions. We're not even talking about the devastation that gold does uh, when you mine it from the environment. In terms of the emission intensity, this is another way to look at environmental impact. So this is the amount of emissions per unit of power. Uh, this is halved. So in other words, it's producing only half as many emissions as it used to. And again, this has been predominantly driven by the phenomenal rise in sustainable energy use. And if we look at it again, comparing and contrasting with other industries, it's now the lowest emission intensity of any industry in the world, lower than banking, lower than gold, lower than the industrial sector. And if we look at the predominant power source, so we compare and contrast, so EVs around the world, because they're using grid power, uh, most of the grid today is still powered by coal. It's uh, globally, most power still comes from coal. It's decreasing, but it's still more than 35%. Whereas with Bitcoin, it's much less, and that's because they're able to form direct relationships with renewable operators, which operate off-grid. So Bitcoin is predominantly powered by fallen water. This is a chart that I analyzed about a year ago. So I said I wouldn't go into all 21 of the environmental benefits of Bitcoin. I'd only go into one. So this is one of the benefits. This has now been widely covered in peer-reviewed journals, um, sustainability magazines, and also the odd bit of media coverage. It doesn't tend to get a lot of media coverage because, uh, as you know, it, uh, bad stories tend to tell, sell a little bit better than good ones in the media. What this is telling us is that if you want to achieve a renewable transition, if you want to bring on more variable renewable energy onto the grid, that's great. And there are some big considerations. One of the considerations is that what happens when the wind, wind isn't blowing and the sun isn't shining? And what happens in particular if it's at the time of day where everyone goes home from work? And, and by the way, you know who the worst consumers of electricity are? It's you and me. Uh, because we are the hardest people to for a grid owner to counterbalance because we switch on at exactly the time where the sun no longer is around. <laughs> So at this time of day, we come home from work and everyone switches on at the same time, which is when mm -hmm. there's very little sun around. Uh, and if you have wind, that's good. You can probably use some wind, but what happens if the wind happens to die down at that time as well? And what happens if there's a heat wave happening at that time as well and everyone turns on their air conditioners? Well, now the grid owner's got a real problem on their hands. And what they typically have had to do is as more variable renewable energy comes onto the grid, they also have to buy more gas pika plants, which cost billions of dollars. And what a gas, gas pika plant is, is it's gas fired, so fossil fuels, the name suggests, and it exists for a sole purpose of where there's a sudden spike in demand that it can quickly fire up and meet that additional demand so the grid doesn't black out. So vitally important. And the kicker is that it's not just producing fossil fuel when it's lit. In order to ramp up fast, it has to be idling through the whole year. So it's idling, producing fossil fuels, wasting energy, uh, tremendously expensive for an entire year, just for those little peak times where there's peaks in demand. Now, with Bitcoin mining, uh, this is actually the most flexible user of electricity imaginable. Because it's location agnostic. It can locate itself wherever it wants. It can go directly next to a solar farm or a wind farm. But it's also time of day agnostic. So in other words, a grid owner can say, hey, we're about to, in fact, they don't even need to ring the person up. Uh, they have a direct connection where the, the Bitcoin mining company is incentivized to switch off electricity fast so they can shut down within 1.3 seconds or sometimes 0 0.6 seconds, they can shut down and instantly supply electricity back to the grid. 
What that means is you can obviate the need for gas peaker plants because you can now adjust to that peak in demand by decreasing the demand rather than increasing the supply. So you don't need gas peaker plants anymore. It also means that you can invite more renewable energy onto the grid uh, because now you have a means to counterbalance that intermittency of those renewable operators. And because Bitcoin mining is location agnostic, it can lo locate itself directly next to a solar farm or a wind farm, and it can use that solar energy in the middle of the day where typically it gets spilt into the ground and wasted. No one else wants it. It can soak up that waste and use it, which makes the solar operator or the wind operator more profitable, which means they can expand their operation. So it's been tremendously synergistic. And this is not just theory. It's happening right now. It's happening in West Texas. It's happening in Norway. And India is about to do the same thing because uh, they're ramping up. They want to 3x their renewable generation in the next six years, and they've identified Bitcoin mining plus batteries are two of the strategies they must use to achieve it. So there's been a real narrative shift over the last two years where now there's been 10 mainstream media articles, four sustainability magazines, six peer-reviewed academic publications, three independent reports, all supporting the environmental benefit benefits of Bitcoin mining. Mm -hmm. So I will end that part of the presentation here and I'll invite any of your questions. Um, can you hear me? Loud and clear, Vance. Go ahead. One question is, what if there was like a international power break, like all the power was gone? All what the happens? power in the world? Yeah. I think if all the power in the world was suddenly gone, um, then every system would, uh, the banking system, the financial system, the internet, every system known to humanity would suddenly break and we'd probably have bigger considerations than Bitcoin. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what All it would mean really would be that um, no Bitcoin mining would be able to occur at that time. Uh, yeah. If you think about it compared to gold, a lot of gold is stored in areas which are um, like in secure vaults, which are all controlled by electricity. No one would have access to that. So I think, uh, whereas a Bitcoin wallet, you just have instant access once electricity fires up again. So it'd actually be more resilient, not less. Cool. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, many other questions. Oh, thanks. Uh, Erica has just put up the link to Malcolm. Uh, sorry, to Alex Gladstein's book as well. Oh, I've I've got a question, Dan. Okay, go ahead, Gavin. Uh, thanks so much for the presentation. Really, really illuminating for me. Um, and my question was, um, it's great to use that landfill gas for Bitcoin. And you know, I wanted to sort of reconfirm because I've had this question asked of me by a techie, the techie side of the population you know does it does it compete with another potential renewables use of that same energy source say from a landfill Welcome site to service for yeah. London, Liverpool. or is it the only possible Liverpool. use of that power and the best use of that Rayleigh, power Wickford, yeah. so this is one of the questions that's often asked uh people say well doesn't it isn't it stopping other people who could be using that renewable energy and the answer, actually, I'll answer that question globally, and then I'll look specifically at landfills. So the interesting thing is Bitcoin is by economic incentive. So this is not because Bitcoin miners are green or they, they inherently care about sustainability any more than any other industry. Uh, they don't care about it less, but they don't care about it more. But the incentive structure just works out that they have no economic incentive to compete with other users of power. Because when other people are using power, guess what happens where a lot of people are using power together? What happens to power prices? They go up. And in Bitcoin mining, 70 to 80%, it's the only industry in the world where 70 to 80% of your operational costs are electricity. So that's the only input which you can control, which can influence your profitability minute by minute. And so when wholesale electricity prices go up, you switch off. You're not going to compete. You're going to pull over to the side of the road, metaphorically speaking, uh, and, and because it's not profitable to mine. So it has an inbuilt profit incentive not to compete with other users of electricity, uh, which is remarkable. That's one of the reasons it's so flexible. In terms of landfills in particular, in terms of any stranded form of electricity, 
think of Bitcoin like a dung beetle. It goes around the world scavenging this waste electricity that no one else can possibly use. So, for example, in places like Tasmania, in places such as Spain, in places such as West Texas, or in Darwin in Australia, you've had these, and in the UK even, you've had these massive build-outs of renewable energy uh, through government incentives and government subsidies. The problem is no one gave any consideration because uh, governments are typically not so great at thinking beyond their own next re-election to the state of the grid to be able to handle that electricity or who would be able to use it. So a lot of that has become white elephants. And it's just sitting idle. It's putting most of the wasted electricity just into the ground. It's spilling it, can't use it or can't transport it to the grid. And so what Bitcoin mining companies are able to do is they're able to say, well, you don't have to transport it. Uh, we'll locate right next to you and we'll use it. Uh, and they're also saying, well, we can use that power that no one else wants, which is making a lot of these uh, renewable operations profitable, where otherwise they would have uh, not been profitable at all. And in the case of landfills, that's a classic example where uh, sometimes you can do something else with it, Gavin. Uh, sometimes you can sell that power to the grid. And if you can, you should, because you'll get more selling it to the grid than you will through selling it to a Bitcoin miner. Because you sell it to the grid, you'll probably get... $50 per megawatt hour. If you sell it to a Bitcoin miner, you'll get 10. Or to put in language that you and I are familiar with on our power bill, it's the difference between 10 cents per kilowatt hour versus 1 cent, or 5 cents versus 1 cent. Uh, 1 cent per kilowatt hour isn't a lot, but it's it's a lot over the course of year. If you have 5 megawatts of energy, uh, that's going to result in hundreds of thousands of dollars over the course of a year versus nothing. Uh, and so that's that's good for the landfill owner. So where you cannot sell that power to the grid because it would need a major substation upgrade, that's where Bitcoin mining comes into its own. Uh, and that's the cases that we, our fund is specifically looking for, where it has no option to sell to the grid. It would otherwise be wasted. It would go probably into the air in the form of um, climate-causing methane gas, which is 84 times more warming than carbon dioxide. And we instead provide it an economic incentive that needs no subsidies whatsoever, that can send it to a generator and can monetize it where there would be no other user. And the reason there's no other users on site is that it's going to cost a lot of money to extract that landfill gas. You have to pay for the gas capture and collection. You have to pay for generators. You're talking millions of dollars. And so unless um, most of your operational costs are electricity, you're not going to get that money back. Bitcoin mining companies, the only companies who are going to get that money back because they're the only companies who have 80% of their operational budget which is electricity, so that can pay off that capital investment within three years. That's great. Thank you, Dan. Lovely. Yeah, Andrew, go ahead. Thanks, Daniel. Um, great overview. Um, I'm a uh, level one beginner. Um, I've got one question. Um, with the introduction to Bitcoin, uh, if we wanted to buy Bitcoin, we would use obviously a wallet and uh, and uh, convert um, New Zealand dollars into US, I guess, and then buy Bitcoin. Um, but you've got Bitcoin mining. Are we also buying into that, or are we looking at a opportunity to buy into venture capital that does Bitcoin mining? Oh, okay. So if you buy Bitcoin, you're, you're, it's, think of it simply as it's like buying gold. In the same way that if you buy gold, you're not buying shares in a gold mining company. You're just buying the asset that that gold mining company has produced. So in the right. same way, when you buy Bitcoin, you're not buying any shares in a Bitcoin mining company. You're simply buying the asset that has been produced by those Bitcoin miners. Right. Got you. Okay. If the internet goes down, uh, what's the backup? Well, you can uh, you can use smartphones like I mean feature phones like I say uh, so even though it's called magic internet money it's it's incredibly resilient more so than the traditional financing system because it can run on dumb phones so even if you didn't have the internet uh, right now in Africa there are people who are sending Bitcoin to each other uh, by text message using a sequence of commands on ten dollar dumb phones okay. That makes sense. Thank you.
Hey, Daniel. Hey, George. Um, you know how you said we're going to go through a period of transition from fiat currency to online digital currency? How do you think that period will be? Do you think it'll be quite unstable or do you think it'll just flow naturally or just Well, there's naturally? two directions this could go. Uh, there's no question that we'll go from analog to digital currency. The only question mark is what form of digital currency. And we have one option, which is Bitcoin. Uh, but there is another option. Now, the central bankers, of course, who gets obviated? Who is no longer required in a system which is using Bitcoin? Central bankers, because it's peer-to-peer. -peer. It doesn't require central bankers. What do central bankers do? They control uh, the issuance of new currency, and governments are directing those central bankers about how much money to print, uh, and they're influencing monetary policy. So if Bitcoin is adopted widely then you get the separation of money and state and you have no need for central bankers anymore. Uh, so that's obviously not something that they're keen to see and that's not their vision of the world. So they're busy trying to create their own version of a digital currency called central bank digital currencies or CBDCs, which basically have all of the disadvantages of a fiat currency, which is essentially controlled. You have no control over monetary policy. It's not peer-to-peer. -peer. It can be, except it actually has more disadvantages because it's much easier to surveil. It's much easier to print more money. But you can also do other things, such as you can incentivize people who are buying certain products and penalize them if they're buying other ones uh, by different interest rates. Uh, so it's a slightly Orwellian vision of the future, not one that I'm keen to see. Uh, it's already been used in China as a tool of social credit. And so Bitcoin really represents a system which is saying, well, we don't want a future which is going to have heavier government surveillance, more control, more ability to seize and freeze. If you say the wrong thing, do the wrong thing. Um, so in that sense, it will go one direction or the other. The interesting thing is that in terms of if you look right back to the beginning uh, and Bitcoin user adoption, Bitcoin doesn't even have to become the global currency in order for price to continue to go up. It simply needs to continue user adoption. In the West, the predominant use case is it's a store of value, just like gold. It's just a place to store an asset over time. But in the global South, its predominant use is as a means of exchange because they have a broken banking system. Uh, governments they can't trust or they can trust even less than ours. And they often have high inflation, or in some cases, even hyperinflation. Cool. Thank you. Right. Well, we're doing well for time. We're just about at the hour. Uh, so if there's no other questions, I'll sign off unless anyone has anything else they want to proffer. Um, just one other question. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so if we want to use the money in the real world. Yeah. Do we pay tax? Do we pay tax on it? Uh, it depends on the jurisdiction you're in. Um, so okay. yeah, it really depends on the tax. So if you if you take it only on the profits, is a simple answer. So it's like any asset. Um, in most countries in the world, you have a capital gains tax. Um, in New Zealand, they've worked out a way they can still tax you on their Bitcoin, even though we don't have a capital gains tax. So just like anything, if you make money on real estate under certain conditions, then you'll probably have to pay tax on on the profits you earn. Um, but, but only when you actually, but only if you actually take it out. Uh, and my recommendation yeah. is you don't take it out. You you have it there, no. you keep it there, and then if you ever want that money, you don't take it out, but you get a loan against that money. You use that as collateral. Mm -hmm. Huh? And that's Very becoming good. increasingly common. Uh, what about if you direct it to a tax-free nation? <laughs> <laughs> well, who, who knows? Who knows? Yeah. Beyond my uh, beyond my swim lane, that one. I'm sh I'm sure there's ways. Okay. But I, I wouldn't know personally. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Daniel, I have a question about ESG. Yeah, for... yeah. Oh, sorry. May I ask a question? Absolutely. Hey, um, I have a question about, um, I'm an accountant and we've been told to um, get ready for sustainability reporting, but no one seems to know how to do it yet. And we mainly deal with SMEs and it'll filter down to them at some point that they have to, you know, do some ESG reporting. But 
are there companies that are putting Bitcoin on their balance sheets or investing in Bitcoin mining, um, asserting their their that they're fulfilling their ESG objectives because of Bitcoin? Yeah. Uh, yes, there are. Yeah. The, what's happened in the last year is that KPMG put out a report um, a talking about the ESG merits of Bitcoin. Two years before yeah. that, Price Waterhouse Coopers also put out a report, which was a slightly more um, not quite so bullish on ESG, but the KBMG was very bullish on ESG. And for the first time, a major financial institution was saying um, that you should invest in Bitcoin because its ESG case is so positive. Mm, uh, on all three cases, the EBS Energy. Yeah. Say again? On, on all three cases, the EBS all, all three cases, exactly. So for environmental reasons, for um, social reasons, and also for governance reasons. The governance reason is off the charts because it has mm -hmm. no ability, ability. All those things that can happen under centralized control are just not possible. Um, mm -hmm. Seizing, freezing, corruption is not possible. Uh, Bitcoin doesn't care who you are, where you are, what gender you are, what class you are. It doesn't care. It treats everyone as equal algorithmically. Uh, so incredibly good for governance. So yes, you are starting to see people put Bitcoin on its mm -hmm. on the balance sheet for these environmental reasons. It really and just depends on... Say again. I just wanted to ask too, and running nodes, like Satoshi intended for us all to run a node, I think. Um, but if businesses were running nodes or involved in Bitcoin mining, I'm just wondering about sort of tangible ways that they can be supporting the Bitcoin network and say, I'm doing good ESG here. So. Yeah, so running a node, basically what a node is, there's uh, uh, maybe 10,000 or so, I think 18,000 node runners. So these are people who have the entire Bitcoin blockchain on their computer and the Bitcoin source code on the computer, replicating it. And then the, mm -hmm. so they're not doing the mining, they're, they're simply holding that Bitcoin source code. You can um, have a lake miner, which is also a node as well. I've got one of those. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. so yes, companies can do, they can definitely do that if they wish to. What, what a lot of companies are doing. So you get this kind of schism where some people, uh, if, basically it's a demographic thing. So if the company's run by baby boomers, they'll tend to uh, believe mainstream media and they'll think Bitcoin is bad for the environment because that's what they've read in The Guardian or in the BBC or in The New York Times. If you get people who are Gen X and Gen Y who have already worked out that you can't trust what you work, what you read in the mainstream media, they will are more likely to have done their own research and to follow um, people who know what they're talking about and they will have formed their own conclusions and they will have concluded that it's net positive for the environment and they'll be quite happy to invest in Bitcoin unless it gets uh, vetoed by a baby boomer on the investment committee. So it tends to play itself. Now, these are uh, generalizations, but uh, statistically what I've said is true, but it's not universally true. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but you are definitely seeing a movement where you're seeing more and more people who are deciding, yes, we will actually get involved in this because of its environmental utility. My mm -hmm. feeling is that within five years, you'll start to see uh, ESG investment committees uh, question their fund managers if they do not invest in Bitcoin. Yeah, yeah. so that's where the, that's where it'll, the pressure will start. The yeah. influence will be. Yeah. Okay, great. Thanks for your tips. Good session. Thank you. Fantastic. Okay, great. We've gone a couple of minutes over. Um, thanks, everyone, for your time. If you have any other questions, you're welcome to contact me. Uh, I'm going to stick up those other resources again right now, and I'm just going to leave the session running for a couple of minutes just if you wanted to jot any of them down. So I will put that up again now. Uh, that's some more information that you can gather. So have a great evening, and all the best on your Bitcoin journey. Thank you, Dan. Thanks, Daniel. And uh, Vince, what's the name of your cats? Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Daniel. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Ludo and Trekker. <laughs>